let's go watch it in 2D. No, let's go watch it in 3D. But if we watch it in 3D, then is it worth the cost? This podcast is brought to you by 3D Wiggle. With 3D Wiggle software, you can impress your family and friends with 3D GIFs and videos. To find out more information, please click on the link in the description for 20% off coupon as well. This podcast is also brought to you by Patreon. With Patreon, you can become a patron and get this podcast commercial free and get many more benefits. Please click on the description again to get more information. Now, back to the show. Hello, hello, hello. This is Adolf Vega with 3D or 2D.com, and today I have a very special guest. I have Mr. Evan Jacobs. And uh, first of all, who are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so my name is Evan Jacobs. I'm the stereo supervisor at Marvel Studios. Um, and I've been here for now for, I, I guess, somewhere in the neighborhood of four years. I kind of lost track, but. Um, but I supervise the conversion of the films from 2D to 3D. Okay, great. So um, you've you worked on all the movies since the year time? Yeah. So uh, w- basically our team um, converts all the films. Uh, we don't shoot anything natively, so um, they're all converted. And so I, st- I joined Marvel on um, Captain America Winter Soldier. And I've done every movie that we've done since then. So uh, I don't know. What are we on? 10, 11 movies now? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> it's a lot. Okay. So how long have you enjoyed 3D? Uh, well, 3D for me, I you know, is an, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I was always fascinated with it uh, as a kid. And, and I always had I was a fan of sort of the 50s sci-fi movement, you know, with, it came from outer space and movies like that. And um i remember jaws 3d coming out when i was when i was a kid as well and so i you know i was in captain eo and stuff like that but i didn't really know anything about it professionally um and then uh and then yeah and then i ended up uh coming in to help out a bit on alice in wonderland uh and that that film was kind of a hybrid of what we do today in terms of conversion it was um the the live action material the green screens of the people were all shot um 2d uh or acquired 2d and that but then really the environments uh and the surroundings and all that stuff were all rendered as stereo renders um uh sort of native rendered with a, so we essentially converted the all the live action components and then nested that into stereo rendered material but I, so anyway, I, I came in to help out on the, at the end of that film, and I guess I kind of caught the stereo bug at that point because I saw the uh, creative storytelling opportunities there. Um, it's just like a whole nother – it's a whole nother language for cinema. I mean, it was a lot of fun. So, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that was the, my kind of – when I dipped my toe into the, the format. Okay, so that's how you started professionally, right? Yeah, I mean, my background was visual effects. So I, you know, I started in the film industry doing visual effects, um, did actually doing miniatures, mechanical effects, motion control, the, the, all the physical side of this sort of in the days pre digital, you know, and then, um, and then, you know, when things sort of started shifting away from the physical stuff, um, I transitioned over to um, digital visual effects. And um, and ultimately was a visual effects supervisor for a while and, and, uh, did some of that. And then, and then, like I say, I sort of fell into 3d and, um, and, or we found each other at least. And, uh, and you know, it's a, a conversion in particular is utilizing a lot of the same kind of, um, tool set and philosophy and stuff like that. So it really was able to inform a lot of the, those early years of learning how to do it. Okay, so generally speaking, what is the process for making a 3D movie? Do you watch the entire movie before converting it, or do you go frame by frame, or, or is it how much of it done by robots? 
about it. It's, it's a painfully uh, manual process, I think. But um, you know, like most visual effects, it's there's 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 tools um, uh, there's tools that that sort of allow you to um, make things go faster. But basically, um, uh, the process from a supervision standpoint, which is um, we start by watching the film and Marvel in particular, we're, we're not using, we're not working on a finished film. We're working on a film that's, um, uh, you know, at that stage, a rough cut. And, um, and we, we go through and sort of, I do, you know, what you call a depth script and sort of identify places in the film that maybe would benefit from a strong 3d treatment or places where maybe 3d isn't going to enhance the film as much or, you know, try and find those moments and identify them early and come up with a strategy of conversion, uh, of the film. And then essentially you've got to break the film up into, a, uh, a, it's, it's the joke is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And that's basically what we do. So we break the film up into a bunch of shots, individual components, and send those shots out um, to various conversion partners to actually do the conversion. They um, break the shot down into pieces. Uh, so it starts with uh, what we call rotoscope, which is essentially an old technique of creating outlines around photograph material. So we'd outline a person, we'd outline their face, we'd outline their nose, we'd outline their ears, and you know, every anything you'd want to have depth would have to be sort of turned into a region or a shape um, across the frame of that shot. And then, uh, and then, so it could be, I mean, it could be hundreds and hundreds of, of roto shapes, right? Chasing tables and desks and people and, and whatever else is in the frame. And that's the step, that's step one. And that process has some, there's some automated tools that help you with that, but basically it's a manual process and it's generally done in in places like India and and China and uh, places where there, where, where labor is less expensive and, and, um, and, you know, we kind of go at it that way. Um, and then from there, once you have it turned into, um, a whole bunch of roto shapes, then you turn it over to uh, what we call a depth artist, which would be somebody that takes those shapes and all those different components and pushes them into depth and says, this thing is behind this thing. This thing is further in in front of this other thing and sort of lays everything into space, into 3D space so that you have a sense of where things are. But still at this stage, things don't necessarily have what we call internal volume, which would be basically if you imagine – uh, to describe it in in, uh, in in audio only is is challenging, but I'll give you an idea. So if you imagine if you had an image of a circle, that if you were to cut that circle out and pull it off of the background, it would still look like a circle. It would just look like a circle floating off of the background, right? But if you wanted it to look like a sphere or a ball, you'd have to actually puff it up, right? And and the and the closer you get to that thing being round and being actually like an actual ball shaped, um, that's what that's a characteristic of 3D we call roundness. And uh, what that would essentially do is the amount that you the amount of internal volume you give to objects it kind of defines the 3D effect that you're going to create. And so if you have somebody's face, you can cut out their edge, and and then they look kind of like they've been um, you know cut out and stuck on a piece of cardboard. But if you take the time to pull their cheekbones out and to pull their nose, the tip of their nose out and to pull, um, you know, to separate all those individual components that make someone look like a human being, you create more, a more round place, pleasing shape out of somebody's face, just as an example. So that's the depth stage. And so you essentially break them, break the, now we've got a shot that's been separated into depth. We've c- kind of created in our internal volumes and then, the the challenge there is that because we photographed with one camera, not two, as we've been pulling all these things away from their backgrounds, we've revealed holes, um, what we call occlusion, areas that have, have now been revealed that previously you couldn't see um, in the other eye. So imagine if you uh, use your left eye as your main camera, then the right eye camera is going to see around things in a way that, that would create – there would be gaps in the background 
And that could be as simple as your arm going across your body. It could be the entire person going across the background. So all that's got to get recreated somehow. And so depending on what the content is, um, there are different creative ways of doing it. But that's essentially the process we call paint, which would be um, on a, a simplistic level. It's painting in the occluded areas, filling in all the gaps and creating a finished shot. And that's kind of how it works. Now, once we've done all of that, we might do we might iterate on any part of this process. So, the, you know, the artist might send us a depth pass, and we send it back and say, "Yes, that's cool, but move this forward, move this backward." Same with the paint. We might say, "That's good, but there's a weird edge on this um, on his shoulder, and uh, the background has a weird warping effect that we don't like." So, you know, and so there's multiple steps to this. How long does it take? Well, uh, if you think about it, um, one shot from beginning to end, you know, the average life cycle of a shot might be a few weeks, uh, say three weeks, something like that. But what happens uh, is it depends a lot on the details. So if a shot is very long, it takes longer to do. If it's shorter, it takes less time. So the length matters quite a bit. And obviously, there are thousands of shots. I mean, um, uh, well, on, on Winter Soldier, the first film that I did here at Marvel, we had, I think, 3,200 cuts um, in the film that had to be converted. So that's 3,200 of these the, the shots that have to go through this process. And those are just the ones that are in the finished film. But because we're working on a, on a film that's not finished in terms of editorial, um, we're, we're converting more than that. Right, we're converting extra frames that we don't need. We're converting extra shots that get that fall out of the cut. We're the the, the process is uh, it's a staggering amount of data, <laughs> and so in terms of the timeline, you know, yeah, it's it's not like you could say, okay, give me the whole movie and in three weeks I'll have the whole thing done. It, it doesn't work like that. But but a shot probably is around that long. Okay. What kind of software do you use? I mean, I don't want industry secrets or anything. I'm just curious for anyone out there that wants to get their hands wet. What kind of software, you know? Yeah, well, there's there's a couple of core um, tools that people use. Um, for for the rotoscope tool that that's that's really industry standard is called Silhouette, and it's uh, and it's um, got a lot of custom tools to isolate. Um, isolate things in a frame and, and even things that are moving. Um, so silhouette is a big tool that you use sort of in the early part of the process. And then, and then quite a bit of the work is done in a piece of software called nuke, which is, um, uh, which is a, by the foundry and nuke is a compositing tool. So that's a, that's a, these are actually, both of these pieces of software are common visual effects tools as well. So people that are, that's one of the ways that people end up in stereo is they start out wanting to get a career in visual effects and they, um, you know, don't, it's a, it can be an entry point for people that are looking for a visual effects career is that they learn these tools and they get to use them in this capacity. And then later on they start doing more and more kind of traditional compositing like visual effects compositing and, and they, you know, move into ultimately 2d or continue and, uh, do 3d, stereo uh, stereo compositing or whatever but it's the same tools so um, the, that's kind of the common tool set and then there are proprietary tools there are tools that that each company we use develops to make things go smoother for their particular pipeline so there are specialty things in there sort of mixed in here and there um, but those two pieces of software are available and people can check them out I think nuke even has a I think the Foundry has a training edition that you can get for for free, so you can kind of play around with it and get a feel for how it works. So, okay. Um, so, do you ever actually have conversations with the director or the cinematographer to make the three D look best? You know, either that. Are you part of the ongoing process? I mean, it sounds like you're in the middle of it, but you know, it, it kind of seems like some people do three D at the end, and like you know. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing here at Marvel because we have a little bit of a different approach than some companies do. Um, we, because we're here and we work on all the films and we and there's no mystery about um, the fact that we're going to be involved, um, 
it, 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 we put in a unique situation because we have the opportunity to get involved in shows very early. So there's obviously um, there's a budgetary com- component to having a supervision team on a show very early when you're not really going to do a lot of heavy conversion work until kind of late in the film because you want to wait until the movie's almost done before you start. Otherwise, you're going to be converting lots of material that you don't need. So you wouldn't typically start, say, during the shooting of the film. And so in, in a, in a, at a lot of studios or in a lot of situations, they don't really have a way of bringing a stereographer on board early because they would just be sitting around. But because we're our movies kind of overlap movie to movie, I mean we released I think four movies in just over 12 months or whatever, um, we're able to – be involved very early, have meetings with the filmmakers before they start shooting. Be, you know, um, we vi- do set visits to the set. We send out lots of different stuff. We, we, we're working with them all the way through because we're here doing other films. So there's an economy of scale that comes from that, if you get what I mean. And so we're able to be involved very early. So, I mean, it depends a little on a filmmaker's interest in being involved. Um, some... Filmmakers, um, I you know James Gunn comes to mind as somebody who's particularly passionate about 3D. He really enjoys it, um, enjoys the process, cares what it looks like, and um, and designs for it. Honestly, designs with the, the visual effects with it in, with 3D in mind and things like that. And so when you do that, um, he creates uh, an environment where we can succeed um, with with his film. So. He's super involved, coming to reviews once we're into the conversion phase. He's giving notes. He's uh, he's involved kind of at every level. Um, some of the filmmakers are, uh, you know, less knowledgeable about 3D, and so it, it, every film's kind of got a different um, uh, dynamic, if you will. Um, just in case anyone listeners are, are not sure, James Gunn did uh, both Guardians of the Galaxy movies, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so how much does it cost, generally speaking, to make a movie 3D? Well, you know, it, it, that's a tough question to answer uh, sort of along the lines of um, how long is a ball of string, right? But uh, it's – but I will say um, – I mean the price – the way the pricing works is kind of by the minute. So the length of your movie sort of determines to some extent how much it's going to cost to convert. And there are different price – levels depending on how um what your expectations are in terms of quality it's like anything else right so um it's not that no matter you know if you spend x number of dollars you're going to get a better product but there is an element of that so there are people out there uh, there are filmmakers out there that um or let's say studios let's not say filmmakers that that maybe see 3d as a as something that's really popular in china for instance and so they might Say, oh, well, we're going to convert the film just for China because China really loves 3D, so we're going to do that. We're not going to release it anywhere else. And because the filmmakers don't maybe see the movie in China and don't care or don't know or whatever, maybe they can get away with spending less money and less time and energy on the, that conversion. We don't have that viewpoint at Marvel. Um, every single territory matters to us. And so um, – in terms of quality and, and the expectation is that everybody's going to get the same movie. So we, um, we approach things differently than, than, than certainly some of the smaller independent companies do. Um, and that has a price tag, but, um, but on the other hand, we've created a lot of efficiencies over the years. So we're able to do things, um, a little more efficiently than some people are as well. So, I don't mean to dodge your question, but it's really a tough one to answer because, you know, everybody's going to go out and have a different experience about how much it's going to cost. But the, the the length of the movie makes a big difference. If you're converting a 90 minute movie, it's going to cost a lot less than an hour at 20, you know, or I'm sorry, a two hour movie. So, you know, Avengers Infinity War that just came out, I think is the longest uh, Marvel movie that obviously costs more. Uh, yeah, it's also very complicated, right? So that that film had um, interesting complexities beyond just straight conversion, because um, one of the things that we wanted to do with that film and trying to take the always trying to raise the bar in terms of the quality is um, so we have you know imagine a traditional conversion shot where you you really just have 
you know, the most basic level, it would be a non-visual effect shot. It would be just a, a regular photograph shot of people talking or something, right? And you'd take that shot and you wouldn't have anything to, else but that. And you would convert that into 3D. Well, that's sort of the simplest level of how you do this. But once you have visual effects involved, inevitably, you, you're like, well, somebody took the time already to get a bunch of layers so we have a clean background already we don't have to recreate the background we can just get that clean background that's from the visual effect shot and, and all the cg characters come with alpha channels or edges already predefined we can get those and hey most of these cg characters actually come with what they call a, a z depth map which is a essentially a gray shaded depth map of those characters we can get those so we can get a, we can leverage a lot of the work that the visual effects teams are doing to create a better version of 3D, but of course that has an additional expense because we've got to now get we've got to go collect all of those assets as well um, on a shop by shop basis, and so that adds to the complexity and the cost, but it also increases the quality tremendously. So um, that's something that 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 we do that some people do less of, um, and a, a movie like Infinity War had, I mean. It was almost all visual effects. I mean, I think there's whatever, 20 or some odd, 20 to 30 non-visual effect shots in the whole film. So so there's a lot of opportunities to get these assets. And then add to that this this added layer, which is that there's, there are sequences in the movie that are all CG, where there's no live action component to the shot. And in, you know, all CG characters, big CG environments – and in those situations, when we can and when it makes sense, we try to actually render those as native stereo renders. So now you're talking about going to the visual effects company and saying, hey, can you just render another eye for us and um, and give us back a stereo shot instead, which sounds simple enough. It's just hitting a button or whatever, but there's complexity to it, and that has an additional expense as well. So it, it, there's a spectrum of this in terms of how you approach it, but for us, the quality is kind of the key – um, and trying to create a really um, um, amazing event experience for people when they go to see it. And we take it, we, that's the way we approach it. So, like, for example, Groom and uh, Rocket are CG only characters. They're a little bit easier to put into the 3D because they're already 3D <laughs> compared to, you know, Captain America. No, exactly. And, and, and think about, I mean, there's some fascinating things though, that, that like with Groot and, uh, well, sorry, with Rocket, for instance. So Rocket has, uh, is a, is a lot of fur. So if he was, if you were just going to do a straight conversion with no elements of him, you've got to go in and you've got to hand isolate every bit of that fur off of the background, right? Um, this is going to take a long time and it's inevitably you're going to make mistakes and it's going to look pretty chunky. But if we get an alpha channel for him or, you know, his, basically his mat, his edges, we're going to get a nice clean edge for all his, all of his hair and he's going to look a lot cleaner. But think about this. He has some whiskers on the front of his nose and in a close up, those whiskers need to be separated from the rest of his whiskers or the rest of his hair. So, but the visual effects team wouldn't typically separate them. There wouldn't be any reason to. For, for, from a visual effects standpoint, they wouldn't need it. So we've still got to we, – so because we're involved early, we're able to go to the visual effects companies before they're – you know, while they're still working on the on the setup and say, hey, listen, by the way, when you're rendering Rocket, can you please give me these whiskers separate f specifically for stereo so that we get clean nose whiskers separate from cheek whiskers? Yeah, that looks awesome. <laughs> um, so is that one of the biggest considerations? Um, you know, sometimes there's issues with uh, darkly lit scenes and, you know, blackness of space and some ghosting double images. How do you compensate for that? Is this a limitation? Well, it's it's, it's challenging um, from an exhibition standpoint, right? It's just the 3D, um, if you think about it, basically the technology is um, – you know, there, 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 there's new stuff coming, and there's brighter projectors. We, but the base, the mass market 3D experience today in, in an exhibition environment in a theater around the globe is pretty, um, pretty rough, right? Because the projectors, um, the, the you take a base digital projector and you. Um, and you take it from a projector that was okay for 2D, and you suddenly pump 3D through it. And inevitably, the bulb isn't bright enough, and the the screen, you know, to get the polarized 
glasses to work is silver, so it's sort of shiny and kind of creates a hot spot. So the center of the frame is bright, but the edges are falling off to dark. And even in a relatively well-maintained theater, it can be um, not the best looking experience. Um, and, and a lot of theaters are not terribly well maintained when we go out and we, cause we do this, we go out and check theaters and stuff. And it's pretty shocking what some people, you know, experience, or, I mean, I had the experience myself. I went and saw ready player one in 3d and I was like, Oh my God, what, what happened to this movie? Like, what did they do? And it's the, the project, the, the theater itself, you know? So it's frustrating for us. And so what we try to do is present, uh, we, we do a special grade specific, a special, um, color correction pass specifically for 3D and specifically for a low brightness environment like that to try and compensate and do our best to control um, those to, to control those the kind of problems you're talking about dark scenes get lifted and brightened um, ahead of time so that when they get presented they're hopefully going to hold up and you're going to have a good experience it's a tricky thing though because you're making you know I mean Avengers went out to 6,000 screens or something like that. And you can't predict what they're all going to look like. You just can't, you know? Um, now, meanwhile, the good news is that what's happening rapidly is people are starting to deploy these new laser projectors and other, and, and some other exciting new technologies like these monitor walls that are, um, that are creating much brighter 3d right and so we actually do a separate grade a separate color correction pass specifically for these high brightness theaters to create to preserve the creative intent of the movie so we don't take that low brightness master that we've developed and play it super bright and have it all washed out and gross we we have a separate master specifically for that and i always encourage anybody that's passionate about 3d or, or wants to see 3d in the best kind of as a creatively was intended to be seen is try and find a laser projection system somewhere in, you know, whether that's an IMAX laser or whether, you know, there's, there's some other exhibitors around that are, that are moving this direction. Um, or at a minimum, try and find a bright theater, a theater that actually takes the time to project their image as well. Because if you find, if you have a good experience, you're probably going to get it again. And, um, and the, it's, the, the difference is stunning. I mean, it, the difference in the experience is stunning. So, and I, I feel like we're in the, you know, we're, the exhibitors are going through an ex, uh, sort of a phase of upgrades and we're going to start seeing the project, the price point of these laser projectors is coming down and people are starting to see the economy of it and stuff. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that we're going to start seeing 3d presented as it really is intended by the creatives. And that's the, probably the single biggest complaint that I hear is that it's too dark. And so you know, it's driving me, it drives all of us crazy that, that the exhibitors don't take more care, but it's, you know, look, it's a business and, and they've got, you know, the bulbs are not cheap. And I, I mean, I, look, I get it, but, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're hopeful that, that people are going to keep improving this and, and you're going to start seeing things uh, much better as we go. Yeah. Last year I watched, um, the last Transformers movie in laser IMAX 3D, and it looked fantastic. Yeah. It, you know, the movie itself is not anywhere as good as Marvel movies, <laughs> even at that. But the 3D was fantastic. And the theater is like the biggest IMAX theater in the state of Texas. So it's really nice. And, you know, I definitely want to go back there and maybe for the third time I see Avengers Infinity War, to, you know, we see it there because, you know, I've saw it twice already and I love it. And, um, you know, that laser IMAX 3D experience is fantastic. And like, so you saw, you saw Infinity War in 3D though, right? I saw Infinity, the first yeah. time I saw it in IMAX 3D, the second time I watched it in 2D and I actually did miss the 3D when I watched it in 2D. But, yeah. you know, I appreciate the film more in a different way because I was able to, you know, see the difference. And well, Part of what we're trying to do is really create, you know, it's not – this is the thing about 3D and that's the, 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 interesting to me is it's a different way to experience it. And so even filmmakers – because they're not in our 3D reviews every day. I mean, it's difficult because they have so many things to do um, as we're finishing one of these films that the 3D process is, 
you know, we're showing them stuff when we can. The same with the Russos. We showed them as much as we could, but it, you know, they're, they're, you know, they got press tours and we're coming in really late. So we're, we're at the right at the end of the schedule. So we're, we're showing them as much as we can, but you know, they don't see all of it. And then they come and when they finally do see it all put together, they, they inevitably are like, Oh my God, I had no idea that was even there. Like, you know, there's, there's just like little nuanced stuff that you see in 3d that you didn't expect. But that doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that there's no reason to see the 2d version because they're both valid. You know, it's like two different ways to experience this thing. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's great to, that people go back and see the movie a few different ways, you know? And, and, um, but we certainly try to make sure that the 3d ticket is worth it and that they're getting something special out of it. And certainly I feel like when I look at the numbers, I mean, it's funny because people talk about 3d and is it declining and you know, this and that. And, um, the MPAA recently put out a report for 2017 and they, you know, they sort of the numbers that they showed for North America were that, you know, the, the ticket sales for 3d had declined like 18% or something like that Mm -hmm. gross ticket sales. And, but, and I was like, Oh my God, that looks terrible. Like 3d must be really going down. But then it was like, Oh, well actually 15% fewer 3d movies were released last year too. So of course the numbers went down. (laughs) Industry went down last year too. So it's not just 3d. (laughs) No, exactly. So that's the thing. And so, you know, the, the, the truth is what I've seen in the, in the years that I've been doing 3d is that the, the passionate people, the people that care about it and people that enjoy it, they, they haven't left. They're still there and they're still watching the movies. Of course, there are lots of people that, you know, don't enjoy wearing the glasses or, you know, my kids don't love wearing the glasses. I mean, I get it, you know, um, but the people that do, they're, they're a loyal audience and they come to see the movies. And I, I don't think it's, it's going to go anywhere because of that. I think it's a, it's a totally, it's a great way to see it. You just want people to have choice. Yeah. Um, so let's move on. Uh, would you consider yourself a part of the tech or part of the movie industry or both? Uh, well, I would consider myself part of the film industry i mean that's certainly what to me 3d is a storytelling tool and that's the way i look at it i look at it the same way you would look at depth of field or something it's there's an opportunity to direct the viewer's eye and to create uh, you know and to uh, give people to help tell the story right so whenever we approach a shot we're sort of looking at the shot and saying okay 3d for us is um can be really cool, but if it distracts from the story, then we don't want to do it. Just be, we're not going to go just for cool, you know. We're going to go for what enhances the story. So, um, so I, I, I mean, it's a techno, it's a I, visual effects in general is this way, and that it, it, you know, it's a marriage of art and technology, and and that's what's kind of fun about it is that it's a, it's, it's, um, you're going to get to do both, but I wouldn't. It's it's definitely more of an artist driven thing than a technology driven thing, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Do you think three D is appropriate for all movies or just specific movies? Well, I I'll tell you, I one of the things that's fascinating to me, it's a tough question to answer because I think it you know, certainly certain kinds of filmmaking are uh, less pleasant to watch in three D. You know, you think about like really shaky cameras and things like that are kind of like not as pleasant an experience to experience to watch. So there's that. But but to me what's interesting is people tend to gravitate to like, oh well, the big epic wide shots of the city exploding, those are gonna be the three D moments, you know. And what you find as you convert films is that is that actually a lot of times the dialogue scenes uh sitting around the campfire are the ones that are actually more engaging because the shots are much longer and you have an opportunity to really soak it in. So uh, I, 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 you know, I don't think, I mean, I thought Hugo was cool. I mean, I thought, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think a drama is, is, is something that can't be 3d. There is a, there is a cost associated with it. And, and certainly certain kinds of films probably aren't eventized enough to make sense in a 3d, in 3d, in the way that the business deals with 3d, if you get what I mean. But, um, but I think certainly if the filmmaker is into 3d, I don't see any reason. I mean, you know, whatever gravity was amazing. I mean, there, there, there are fun 3d movies that aren't superhero movies, if you will. Do you feel comfortable allowing your kids to watch 3d? I know kids and 3d are kind of one of those things that parents worry about. My kids really get a kick out of it. My kids are, are, um, yeah, 
six and eight years old, and they uh, they get a kick out of it, but they but they don't love wearing the glasses, and, and so you know it sort of depends a little bit on on the film. But I I, I don't feel like there's I, I don't have any kind of physiological concerns or damage concerns on that level. I, that doesn't I, that isn't something I I would I would think parents should be concerned about. I think in terms of whether the kids are going to enjoy it or not, or whether they're going to fidget and take the glasses off. I mean, that part kind of, I think I'd rather they watch a 2d movie than a 3d movie with the glasses off. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you remember your first 3d movie? I, I remember seeing, I saw, I mean, it goes back a ways, but I remember seeing like a revival of house of wax, which I thought was really cool. And that was like, and these are some of these older films that are fun to, to go back to and, and, See, you know, the the, the tech tech the technology was pretty rough, and so it's it's a tough experience now as a professional to look at them. But it's um, but it's it's I don't know. There's something kitschy and fun about it. Um, and you know, yeah, that was me. Like some of those earlier movies, and like I said, Jaws 3D and some of those things. But yeah, my first 3D, which you may get mad at me, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, uh, I went to see it in IMAX. And it was the first showing of Superman Returns. Oh. And they actually had segments where you put on your glasses and they'll put on a little icon in the bottom of the screen and say, hey, put on your 3D glasses now. In five seconds, you'll have 3D. And then the next scene was in 3D and then it'll, take, it'll be 2D again right away. And it's... it was fun. It was just kind of weird to, you know, that you know, can't imagine that happening anymore. But, you know, no, that was the, the, the. I'm telling you, there was a crazy time in the industry where people were just trying to figure 3D out and just trying to figure out what to do with it. And um, and so they tried a lot of different things. And I remember, I had um, I had supervised the 3D conversion of um, uh, the Conan remake, the Conan the Barbarian remake that nobody saw, but it was. Um, but we. And, and the producer came to me at the beginning of that and said, like, okay, so how many minutes do you think we need to convert? And I was like, well, we should do all the minutes. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like maybe some of the minutes will be shallower, but we should do all the minutes, you know. And uh, But that was the thought. It was like at the time, I was like, oh, well, we'll just do certain scenes or certain reels, and we won't do the whole movie. And, and I just was like, man, that is crazy. But um, – but people were trying out different stuff, and in, because you pay by the minute, there was a there was a sense of like, well, this is this is where we're going to do it. I think over time, you know, it sort of settled out and made more sense to people that like, oh, this is how this should be. But <coughs> but, but, but it's still, it's interesting as an art form because people are still trying to figure out exactly. I mean, you know, with Ready Player One, it was interesting to watch that movie and see, you know, they they really approached those all the live the sequences that were shot on film, the the the, the stuff in the real world, if you will. Um, was all very shallow, and then they, you'd go into the virtual environment. It was all much deeper, and and you know that the, the, those kinds of creative choices are still being made to try and like find ways to use this in an interesting way. Yeah, I actually noted that in my review that it's very weird because like you know, it really is very limited 3D in the you know, live action shots, but the you know animated shots are fine, and it's just it's really weird to jump back and forth so many times in the movie. And, you know, I well, especially like especially in the middle of scenes, right? You yeah. had that happening, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it. We that's what I'm saying though. Is it? it you know, the interesting thing about 3D, I tell people this all the time, is it's a very subjective thing, and so um, different people experience it differently, and people have completely. They're totally professional stereographers. There's a small group of us that we all know each other, and and. They have different. The, each of these guys has a different point of view of, of even how 3D should look. There's not one way, you know. It's like you can make a black and white film, you can make a color film, you can make a film that's that's color but has just limited, but desaturated. I mean, it's the same. You can, you know, you can do this a music with a, a movie with a lot of music, a movie with no music. I mean. 3D is the same way, and you can make choices about like some people like a lot of volume, internal volume in their characters, and some people like characters to look they prefer the the experience of them being a little bit more what we would call cardi it just depends on what people want to do and and because the art form is you know is really just a canvas to paint whatever you want um 
you know, that that's what the, the ready player one guys decided to do that. You know, I, I don't know that I would make the same choice, but that, that it's a totally valid choice and it, it makes us, it, you know, philosophically, it totally makes sense. Yeah. You know, for, yeah, I was thinking about that too when I was reviewing it. I was like, this is obviously a choice. It's not like they, you know, they did this on purpose to kind of highlight maybe for them to make the Oasis more interesting visually. But it's weird as an audience to see that. It's an interesting choice, but I don't necessarily, it's hard to, you know, I appreciate it, but I didn't think it was great. You know? Well, it's the same thing with them shooting on film, right? They shot. The, all those scenes were shot on film, and then and then the Oasis is all digital acquisition, right? So, it's a, or rendered. But you 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 sort of have that same thing happening of like making a choice to say like we're going to degrade this imagery so that you really feel the difference, kind of this Wizard of Oz style thing. I you know I don't know. It's a fascinating it it's fascinating to see what what different artists do with this format because there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. So, excluding Avatar and excluding your Marvel movies, what is your favorite 3D movie? Well, I I think that the two that come to mind, one was Gravity, which I thought was just awesome. I mean, the, I, seeing Gravity in a big theater in 3D is just like mind-blowingly amazing because the shots are so long and this and it's just so freaking cool. Um, and I remember I was telling my – I went to see it um, without my wife and then I later – showed my wife the movie in 2d because we couldn't get to a 3d showing and she was like yeah it's okay what's the big deal i was like no this is a movie that actually it, it, my little light bulb was no this is a movie you have to see in 3d like you have to see it this way it's not a movie otherwise it's like you know what i mean like that is the movie it's incredible yeah and, i actually um, have the opposite of <laughs> um my wife, I took my wife there and she was like, man, the 3D was great and I love the movie. It was so exciting, but I don't want to see it again because I'm so intense. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's like the 3D made it more intense and it was something I won't forget, you know. No, it's incredible. And then the other one that a lot of people didn't see was um, what was awesome was The Walk, which is oh, and yes. that one's really fun. And yeah. uh, for all the reasons you can imagine, you're up on top of a building looking down. I mean, it was just a blast, and they did a great job with it, and it just looked really, really fun. It was yeah. a, that was a movie I remember sitting in the seat going, God, I'm glad I'm seeing this in 3D. This is really great. Yeah, same thing. My wife and I were watching it. We're, like, gripping the armrests because it was just, like, so intense when, you know, that was some of the best depth-based 3D ever. And yeah. It yeah. was just, you know, I really got the sense of height there, and I love that movie too, and I love the three D in that movie too. So, well, and what we're talking about with both of those films is films that really um, just aren't they don't translate to two D. Like they, they, that's not the same movie. I yeah. mean, you, you just have a completely different experience in the three D, and that's what. You know, sometimes you get lucky with that, and um, I wouldn't say that every Marvel movie we've done is that way, but there are definitely some that that it's the definitive way to see it. I mean, Dr. Strange is an example of that where you, 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 I feel like in pretty much everybody, including, you know, the filmmakers and everybody else was just sort of like, once they saw the 3d, they were like, this is the way to see this movie. And that's why we, we actually did the premiere for Dr. Strange in 3d, which we typically don't do um, because we have so many people uh, in the seats and, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a crazy scene, but those premieres, but, um, but we premiered that in 3d because it was just such a, it just needed to be 3d. That movie, it was incredible. Yeah. So what previously released Marvel movie would you change aspects of the three? Um, you know, I'll tell you, I, it's an interesting question. I, uh, we, what's been happening a lot is we're getting to this 10th anniversary of Marvel is we're, we're finding every movie we end up flash doing flashbacks to other films. And so we've had flashbacks to, um, Civil War in Spider-Man, or we've had uh, flashbacks, you know, whatever. There are flashbacks in these films where we flash back to old films, and we're able to, and we and we inevitably go like, oh, well, we'll just pull up that material that we already have in 3D. And when we look at it, and it happens in every single film, we end up going like, oh no, we're gonna have to redo this <laughs> yeah. because we're constantly pushing it further, right? So I remember being very proud of Guardians One. But when Guardians 2 came out, we had um, scenes from Guardians 1 in Guardians 2, and we had to reconvert them all. We, we started from scratch on all of those shots because, because every one of them just – we'd taken it so much further that they seemed completely out of place. Yeah. 
and you know part of the i guess being an artist is that your art is never complete it is that's, good enough and you no move that's on. Exact, <laughs> you it's abandoned right yeah no, let's see. You don't finish it. You abandon it. And that's, that's, well, for us, we kind of run out the clock. So we, inevitably we, we run out of time. We never like walk away going like, wow, that one's perfect. You know, it's not that, but, but you try to do your best and, and, but you know, there's always not, as we go, we, we, you, if you were to put the movies up, um, certainly since I started here and, um, you would see a steady progression of things getting deeper and deeper and deeper in terms of overall pixel depth. Um, and, and, uh, that's, be and, you know, sort of the level of roundness of characters and stuff like that. We like, we, we just continually push it and, um, and try to make it more, uh, a, a more, it, we finding it gets more immersive. And once you go there, it's really tough to go back. So, um, you know, the movies are probably, I mean, to, in terms of like overall depth budgets are probably twice as deep as they were three years ago. So. What examples, what specific scenes are you most proud of the 3D? I, I think I can think of – there are little moments in each film that I, I, I kind of go to. I mean, you know, there I, I, I kind of – I'll avoid the spoilers of Infinity War, but there's some really fun sequences in that film that, that turned out really great. Um, there's a sequence with Doctor Strange and Thanos that is uh, – that's really fun. Um, I'm very proud of that. The, if you go back a little bit, I mean, I think, it, you know, each scene has its thing The kind of what pops into my mind is, as you asked the question was the, the magical mystery tour from Dr. Strange, which is, is a crazy amalgamation of different imagery. It's just like this insane acid trip of imagery, but it also is the thing that, um, I just loved how people experienced it because people would come out uh, after seeing that and they would just go like, oh, my God, I, yeah. I'm losing my mind. You know, and it it's fun to create that effect on somebody. So, Well, obviously, Dr. Strange comic is very psychedelic. That's how it was originally drawn back in the day. So yeah. it makes sense to have that in this <laughs> Well, in that movie, I mean, that was a movie that was meant for stereo, right? I mean, we identified that movie while they were still in prep. Like, they hadn't even gone to shoot yet. And we were, like, looking at the previs and going, like, oh, we are going to go crazy with this movie. And I remember even Kevin Feige saying in some interviews that th the 3D was going to be the best 3D we've ever done and all this stuff. And we were sort of like, okay, I guess we better go for it. <laughs> so yeah. that's what we did. So how do you see role, your role in 3D evolving with technology? Do you think there's ever going to be a point in time where you basically put the movie in the computer and put a switch and 3D is done? Or no, you think it's always going to be a human you know, touch? Yeah, I don't see that. Um, I, I, I'd love to see – there's parts of the process that are really uh, tedious, so I'd love to see that stuff get – um, more automated. We're always looking for ways to automate our pipeline and make things go smoother and, and faster. But the whole idea is to empower the artist, not to take them out. So, we, you know, w there really is an artistic part of this process and you have to, you have to look at the shots and you have to say, and you have choices to make. And you, do you go deeper here? Do you go shallower here? Do you put a lot of volume in this or a little bit? Or, you know, how do you treat it to tell the story, uh, in, the, in a way that makes it, um, more immersive for the audience? And, and that's just not something you're going to hand off to a computer to decide. So, um, so in terms of like the technology of it, trying to use the tools, and certainly from an exhibition standpoint, trying to create pr brighter projectors and more immersive environments. I mean, I've seen some incredible stuff that's coming in terms of what people are going to be able to do. And this, if, if we can get that out there um, in the next few years, I think people are going to really – start to understand what 3d has to offer in a way that maybe if you don't live in a big city where you have laser projectors and stuff today, you're probably experiencing 3d in a way that you're like, man, why do people like this? But it's, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty awesome when it's done, when it's done well and presented well. So, so what are your thoughts on the recently um, shown case, uh, Samsung led 3d theater technology? Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty pumped about it. There's there's Samsung and also Sony has has one as well. Um, it's coming really fast. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while, and then like suddenly it's just kind of, you know, we've got a theater that actually has one installed in, not too far from the office, and um, 
it's it's exciting. It's really exciting to see, you know, from my point of view. I mean, I I know I understand like a film purist is going to want a projector in the projector booth, and I get that. And I I I have a nostalgia for it too. But I just I'm a realist, and when it comes to I would rather people have a quality viewing experience and consistency and, and you're going to get consistency, I believe out of these walls that you're not getting out of digital projection and certainly not out of film projection. If you want to go back that far. Um, and it's, and, and I'm just, I'm sort of frustrated even as a film goer going into theaters. I mean, I went to a Dolby, uh, a Dolby vision theater to see a movie and that system is a dual projector setup, right? It's two projectors pointed at the same spot so that you get double the brightness. That's how it, that's kind of how it works. And um, one of the projectors was out of alignment, so the whole image was blurry. And I'm like, this is a premium theater. Like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> how does this happen? You know? And uh, went to the the went to the manager and complained, and they basically turned one of the projectors off. You know, and that's how they solved the problem. And so then it was dark. You know, and that that sucks. It's like. And these are like the you know so I, my hope is that this this new technology is going to make it, um, for lack of another way of putting it, a kind of idiot proof thing that we can we can end up with. You go to a theater in a big environment with 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 the nice comfy leather chairs, but you have some popcorn and some and some people with you, and you and you can have a really amazing experience, and you know that it's going to be a high quality, um, per, you know, exhibition. Do you feel the same way about ultimate real D three D technology? Yeah, so we're well. It, it's a, that's a different thing. Um, th- what they've essentially got is an, an, uh, this new screen uh, material that, um, and we've got them here at Disney. That we, we had that we were the pro, we were the very first deployment of those screens um, here at Disney, where we finish our films, and um, it's awesome. I mean, it's 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 great. There, I everyone should have one of these screens. Um, if you're not going to go with it, you know, with the bleeding edge monitor wall, like it, it is the way to go. It's so much better than the silver screens. It's strikingly different, but you know, the, the tricky thing as a film goer, um, is, is knowing what no theater is going to even tell you that they have hung these screens. You, you, you don't know when you're buying the ticket, what you're getting, you know? So there's, so it's difficult as a film goer until we can get the exhibitors to sort of see the value to they don't have any way to sort of say like, Hey, you're going to pay a dollar more, but we spent, you know, 30 grand on a new screen. You, you just wouldn't know. So, so that's, what's tricky about that business, but the screens themselves are, the technology is awesome. I mean, it, it looks, the 3d looks freaking great on those screens. It's really, really nice. Are you guys working on any projects outside of three movies like holograms or anything or AR? I have um, – we have some stuff like that going on here at Marvel. I, I am so busy with the movies that I haven't gotten terribly involved with that. Um, there are some interesting things like that going on. So I, I don't – but, you know, like I say, for me, it's like they keep stacking the movies up one after another with the release dates. So yeah. <laughs> focus mostly on that. All right. So let's learn more about the native stereoscopic rendering of full CG scenes. Um, you know, it's kind of a complicated thing. We kind of talked about it before with, uh, you know, Doctor Strange, you know. Um, so sometimes you could tell that some movies use two camera system and others are totally converted. You know, you know that, that like you said, that uh, auto body scene, Doctor Strange. Um, mm-hmm. So how does that work? Well, so if you think about, uh, you know, 3D fundamentally is a magic trick right it's it's not the same as seeing something with your eyes but because of the way that it works it's an illusion but what you can do is you can do this path you have this path available to you to can do conversion but where you where we can we sort of try and especially certain times it's really appropriate to use um, some sort of native solution so some filmmakers might actually natively capture meaning they would have two cameras um shooting through a prism so that they actually capturing the the right and left eye at the same time. You don't have to do any conversion. You have to do different things and like clean up and stuff, but you don't have to do that. Um, but you can do the same thing virtually, right? So if you're in a, uh, an all CG scene, you can put two virtual cameras in there and actually render the right eye and the left eye and you don't have to convert it. And if it's an all CG scene, you can, you have a, uh, an opportunity to get an ultra clean, 
um, version of a 3D shot um, that maybe you might struggle with to create as a converted shot, right? So instead of going through all the processes I described for conversion, you could just basically render that other eye. The reality is it's a little more complicated than that because uh, inevitably people put, in, you know, an artist might put a smoke layer that's not a stereo um, rendered smoke layer. It might be a 2D smoke layer. And so then you've got a flat cardy smoke layer in the middle of your 3D scene when you render it. So you've got a, you have to have to sort of have an end to end 3D uh, approach for this really to work. But prevent for you know visual effects companies and visual effects uh, artists that, that 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 have set up their scene appropriately for it it can work well the 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 thing is when you render in 3d you get different artifacts than you get in 2d and so it can be it can be amazing if it's something like especially like if it's something that would be difficult to convert like i think about like something like the mirror dimension in Doctor Strange um, is a challenging thing to convert because it's just the the only thing that's defining the mirror surfaces is reflections, and then the reflection, you know, it's not a very easy thing to convert. But if you could render it, you essentially would get all that stuff for free, and you can have something that looks really extraordinary. Um, it can work really well, but in other times, it, it's there's a lot of overhead and expense involved in setting something like that up, and and if it's like if it's a close up of a of us, even if it's a close up of a CG character, a lot of times you can go like, yeah, I don't know, I'm not really getting. I can show you converted shots, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So, <laughs> it, so you try to pick your battles and find those moments where it would really pay off. If there's a lot of atmospheric stuff, a lot of dust, a lot of debris, a lot of explosions, you know, things like this. Those are things that conversion doesn't do as well. So you find those moments and you do stuff with them. And and then we also do hybrid versions of this where we in, identify specific bits of a, a frame let's say we have a shot that has a green screen element of people that's going to have to be converted because we had didn't photograph it that way um but there's some cg element in the scene that can be rendered in stereo we'll render just that thing and then we'll compile put it into our stereo shot so we, we we sort of the the approaches to this run the spectrum depending on what we have available to us um, so, you know, 3D is very popular in foreign markets. You mentioned China before. Now, now, obviously, they would watch it in subtitles. And I actually have a friend um, who lives in Malaysia, and he said that sometimes the subtitles really are popping out and it's distracting. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, he has to worry about government censorship. Um, you know, are these things considered? When you're making the movie, yeah, we we <laughs> believe it or not. I mean, it's amazing how much, there's so much that goes into releasing one of these films. We we actually put a fair amount of time into the the subtitling uh, placement, and obviously there's a you know hundreds of languages that the thing is dubbed into. But we basically set the placement of the subtitling um, in depth, and then and then essentially they stick whatever language they need to on that on that location, if you will. So we go through the film and, we, you know, there, there are teams of people that do this stuff, but we, we're a part of it and uh, sort of help identify the best approach um, depending on how long the, the translation is going to be. Because sometimes the English translation would be short, but the, but the whatever, the Malaysian translation might be longer or something like that. So you have to kind of take into consideration where the, where the line is going to fall and then do your best. It's tricky with a movie like ours because our movies are tend to be kind of deep and we use actually a lot of what we call negative space or the audience space. We use a lot of that in our in our 3D sort of our 3D palette. We're not just inside the screen, we're also outside the screen. And so putting the text for subtitles then has to go even further out and it becomes kind of difficult to read. Um, so sometimes we'll nest it in uh, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky problem, but we, you know, you don't want to compromise the movie just for the subtitles. So you sort of do your best. Okay. Um, so has the price convert three D movies gone down recently? Or I wouldn't say re I wouldn't say recently. Um, from the time I started, uh, let's say whatever seven eight years ago, um, it's gone down probably by half or maybe more. It's pretty significant price drop in that time frame, but you know it's stabilized. I would say in the last few years to a place that is pretty, like everybody's pretty competitive and everybody kind of hits around the same number. So, 
Um, there was an initial stage of a gold rush of 3D when right after Avatar came out, when everybody got into the business and there was a lot of money being spent. And then I think, um, unfortunately, there were you know there was some work done that wasn't that great, and there were people that that didn't even you know succeed at all and whatever. There was just a, it was just like a funky time for 3D, and now it's sort of stabilized into a, a proper business where people know how to do it. So would it just be cheaper just to film it in 3D with 3D cameras? You know, are there advantages to this? Well, I think uh, I, I, it, it has, it's a difficult thing to quantify. Um, there are some advantages, but creatively, I don't really think it's the way to go. And I'll tell you why. Um, there was a period of time where people were making films like that. And it, what I find is it is that the 3D then sort of takes over the storytelling. And so, um, you find yourself looking at the raindrops falling and stuff like this and you go like, Oh my God, those raindrops are amazing. Look at that. Every single raindrop is some, you know, in, in a different part of depth and it's so beautiful. And what you're not watching is the movie, you know? And, and so if it's a ride film, if it's a, if it's a film that, that was done for a theme park, it, that's exactly what you're supposed to be watching. And it's awesome. And it's an amazing thing to see. And it's, it's stunning. And if you, you know, and you can pull up the most beautiful stereo, uh, native stereo shots and just go like, oh my god, it's incredible. But in practical terms, you can't really control it that much. You have a very limited set of controls compared to conversion in terms of storytelling. So with storytelling, we can artificially change <laughs> where things sit in depth, and and we can put a lot of depth in things that shouldn't have depth, and put and not put a lot of depth in things that should. Um, we, we can kind of creatively draw your eye where it needs to go for the sake of the movie. And that's much, much more challenging to do when you're shooting a movie out of order and you don't really know how they're going to cut it together. And you might have, oh, this shot's really deep and the very next shot in the cut is very shallow. Well, that's kind of unpleasant when it happens. And, and that happens because you're shooting out of order and you have to make choices on where you're setting your cameras up months before. But if in conversion, I can actually editorially, I can see exactly how it's going to cut and I can see that this shot comes better than this, that I can tune it very precisely tune it so that you have a comfortable viewing experience across that cut. And that's the kind of stuff that that's the, that's why I think conversion is superior. The other thing is, is with conversion, you're focused only on the stuff that, I mean, effectively only the stuff that gets used. Whereas you put a great deal of time into natively acquiring uh, um, material that ends up on the cutting room floor. So, there's an inefficiency there from a financial standpoint. Obviously, it's more expensive to do the actual conversion of those frames as opposed to setting up the camera. But on the other hand, you know, it is a trade-off. So, quantifying what native costs is 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 up for some debate because it has an impact on the production, on the speed at which you can shoot. Right? It has some impact on you're setting up an extra camera. Inevitably, you you every time you change a lens, you're changing two lenses, not one. Um, Every single thing you do takes longer, right? You're also pro effectively processing twice as much data at the end of the day because now you've got two cameras worth of data instead of one. You're transferring all that. You're creating dailies out of that and on and on. But it, it's complicated to say that one's more expensive than the other. I mean I, I, would, th I, I would think if I was making a low-budget movie, like a very low-budget movie, like a $2 million movie or something, I would probably try and – I wouldn't – there would be no way I could possibly convert it. So I would definitely be able to acquire something, right? But would it look good? I don't know. You know, once you get up to the level of, of um, you know, a multi-million dollar theatrical big event movie, I, you know, it probably you're, it probably doesn't have as much of an impact. But there's other creative impacts which are interesting. Like um, if you're natively acquiring, you have a limited number of camera rigs that you can do this because every camera needs two cameras. And you only have so many of these things. Whereas if you're shooting 2D, I'm, I, you know, they could have 10 cameras going at once. It's no problem, right? So if it's a big action shot, you could just have 10 cameras shooting. I actually feel like in some ways the best, the best approach in the, in, the, in the abstract would be a hybrid where you actually did acquire some stuff in stereo and you converted. You kind of did both. But nobody – from an economic standpoint, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe that's right. But but if you're but if but if you're I mean, you, you know, so maybe it's not fair to say maybe there are filmmakers out there that can do it. But for certainly for us, it's not something that we're we we're in a position to. It just doesn't make sense in the way that we make our films. 
Um, you would put a lot of time into something that probably wouldn't get used. It's just the way that it goes. Um, a lot of our stuff is virtual environments and things like that, at least on most films. So you think about Infinity War where a lot of the stuff is green screens. So you're kind of back to Alice in Wonderland territory, you know? Do you think Converted 3 can look as good as Native 3D? I think it absolutely can. Uh, I could show you shots and you would not be able to tell the difference. I, I, there's no question in my mind about that. Even experts can't tell. Now, are there shots that it would be difficult to convert that, that would be easier to shoot native? Of course. You know, if you're shooting a, a, a shot in a hay field with blades of grass everywhere, those are difficult to convert. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, they're, they're, inevitably there are shots. Um, there are shots that are that you're like, oh man, I wouldn't wouldn't mind shooting this, you know. Um, but if it, but depending on what it, what the content is, I mean, you you cannot tell, and no. and then and the average viewer really can't tell. But do you understand the you know some people make the argument that it's never going to be as good, and you know it cheapens the artistic value to convert it, and you know it's not real three D. But you know, do you understand? It's that? it's I I I I, I don't. I, I feel like it's it's a, it's an antiquated viewpoint, I, I, and this is just obviously I'm coming at it from a particular perspective. But from my perspective, you you it, it it's sort of like comparing oil paints to acrylics, right? It's like and you look at the final painting and you say like, oh well, that guy didn't use oil painting, so it doesn't count. And it's like really does it? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> does it really matter that much? So <laughs> like like how does the image look though? You know? So if you're there, like I say it. In a perfect world, and in, in, in this is in, in a world of absolutes where where money was no object and all those other things, I I can certainly imagine um, that I even would love to shoot some stuff native and incorporate it into the rest of the thing. That's why we render some stuff native. That's why we do that because we want to essentially do that, employ the misdirection of multiple different techniques. We want that, but but when people say that native is inherently better. Those people are, um, you know, either looking for something out of 3D. They're looking for a, a style, what I what you would call a linear style, which is a <laughs> which is a very classical stereo stereography style, um, which is not what we're trying to do. Like, even if I could do that, I would, you know, like I mean, I could hypothetically, I could convert stuff to look like that. I just wouldn't do it because I I want my characters to look. Um, you know, we're making superhero movies. They're they're archetypes. They 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 need to be big and awesome, right? I'm not going to make a Cardi Captain America if I don't have to. I, I, you know, whereas if you actually photographed it native, you would end up with kind of Cardi stuff a lot of times because it would be on longer lenses and all that stuff. Um, the movie itself, I mean, when you when you capture native. You, you end up with a different kind of movie because essentially the filmmakers are making a 3D movie from the get go. That's a good thing. But it isn't so great when your movie is going to be seen on an iPhone later. We have to make a movie that lives in both worlds. So you end up with kind of compromises being made all over the place. Um, it's just how it works. But, you know, the, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. You know, you do feel that, you know, some studios have poorly converted 3D movies in the past, and maybe gave 3D a bad name or... You know, people don't want to see 3D movies because, you know, I went to go see, you know, Clash of the Titans in 3D and <laughs> it was terrible. You know what I mean? We see everybody brings up Clash of the Titans. Those poor guys. They did that movie in like eight weeks <laughs> from nothing. It's but amazing. you know what I mean, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, 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 I get it. I mean, I, but, I, but the thing is, I've seen native movies that were pretty rough to watch, right? And, and it, it, look at... I, mean, I don't want to bag on any particular film, but like there are definitely films. If you go back into the, the eras when people were shooting a lot of native stuff and there were movies where deep, people didn't put a lot of money into it, and those movies are pretty rough to watch on the eyes. It's it's like anything. It's got to be done well. And so whether it's conversion or whether it's native, it's not – it's not that isn't the dividing line. It's the quality of the artistry that <laughs> that's using the tools. It's not the tools itself themselves. That's what I'm getting at. I agree with you. You know, I saw Terminator 2 3D last year, and it looked fantastic. And obviously, that was not filmed with 3D in mind, but yeah. they took the effort, and it looks great. You know, and it's 
it's a difference between, you know, taking the effort and having the artistic vision and, you know, someone that may just want to make a cheap buck, you know? Well, exactly. And that's unfortunately the, the, the world we, we live in is that there's no, there's no seal of quality to know other than, you know, people like you that are taking the time to let people know what's out there. <laughs> you know, that the, the, if you, if you, if you don't have, you know, if people seek your podcast out or, or, or your blog and they say, okay, well, he saw it and he said that, you know, he saw this and that, then, you know, that's, that's a good thing, right? Because people kind of get a sense of what, you know, oh, I'm not crazy. As opposed to, oh, I just saw it in a bad theater. Because that's the thing that's tough is that people are judging 3D based on a lot of different variables. They're judging it based on the quality of the work itself, but they're also judging it based on the exhibition. It's like, oh, well, the movie was dark. It's like, well, believe me, I didn't put out a dark movie. It wasn't dark. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that doesn't, we're not we watch this stuff before it goes out many, many times. We're not putting it out like dark for the sake of it being dark. It's happening because somewhere in the chain of delivery, it's getting dark, you know, and that's usually the, at the projector, you know, and that's what happens. And I can't control it all. So we do our I, best. <laughs> yeah, I think a good example was this is like uh, streaming a movie on Netflix, for example, mm -hmm. if you have a you know, super fast speed, the movie is going to look perfect. If you right. have a really bad speed, well, Netflix will adjust the stream quality to fit that speed you have for your internet. And, you know, obviously, if you see that movie, you know, when you're like, oh, man, this movie looks terrible. It's like, is it the movie's fault or is it your fault for having bad Wi-Fi? You know, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. And it, it, but it's but it's 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 worse because it's not even the the moviegoer just bought the ticket. Right. Yeah, and it, they didn't. They don't know. And that's the thing that sucks. And, and, and people come out and they go like, man, those filmmakers really blew it on this one. And it's like, no, we, if I could just invite you to a nicer theater, you'd yeah. have a different experience. <laughs> so that's what, that's been our crusade with the, with the exhibitors is trying to get everybody is, you know, to really understand how important it is that people are paying extra for these tickets. And we, they need to have a, they need to really care about their imagery and a lot and a lot of theaters do i mean it, it's it's it, you know and imax being kind of top of the list those guys are amazing and we spend a lot of time with imax we do special versions specifically for imax and stuff and we spend a lot of time with that group making you know and that's why i always tell people try to see the movie there because mostly because it's predictably good you know like it's rare that you have a bad experience with them and uh so, you know, because, because they kind of monitor, I mean, it doesn't mean you're not going to go on a bad night, I suppose, but it's like, they kind of monitor the the brightness of the theaters and the loud, the, 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 whether the volume is right and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of IMAX theaters are decreasing the amount of 3D they're showing. So it's harder to see it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. I know it is. It's, it, but you know, that what's interesting about that is that that's not, um, I, <laughs> part of what's happened you know, yeah, well the imax well the imax um the uh, the way imax works is you know imax as a company is kind of releasing their product to you know they release them they distribute the movies to the individual theaters but the individual theater owners decide what to program so the you know imax doesn't control what gets shown in every theater if you get what i mean so, so they, so, um, to some extent it's a, it's just the public driving that. I mean, I, you know, I, when I watch Twitter, when we release the movies and it's funny because in some markets people are like, Oh my God, there's all three, only 3d movies. I want to see the movie in 2d. And it's like, we can't only see in 3d IMAX with the hell. And then, and there are other, other, other markets where people are like, Hey, where are the 3d man? What's, what's going on? <laughs> so it just depends on what that theater owner decided to do. And so, um, you know, and but I think if if people keep buying the tickets, it'll it'll come back around. And I think you know, like I say, all these all these different exhibitors are coming up with ways to make the experience better. Um, it, it, you know, they're releasing these new projectors and stuff at a lower price point, so people can get into them. And and the these walls, if they can figure out a way to make these walls less expensive, that'll be another way. And I think we're going to get into a world where three D is going to start to look better and better in theaters, and then. I think people will go because the people that do go and have a positive experience are really vocal about how amazing it was. So, yeah. Now, um, 
you said that you kind of contract out, so you do some stuff with Legend, some stuff with Stereo D. You know, can you explain that? Yeah, well, so there's there's a there's a handful of you know, like I said, sort of when at the beginning of the 3D kind of boom uh, it, after Avatar, really, um, there was a lot of companies trying to get into this line of work, and and you know, over time they've kind of like we've kind of distilled down to really whatever it is, four or five kind of world-class companies that are, that are doing the, all the work you see in 3d really are running through one of these four or five companies. And our films are, uh, at Marvel are typically, um, pretty big in scope. And, um, and we, we we're inevitably because we never stop making the movie better, um, until they rip it out of our hands. Our schedules are quite aggressive and, um, challenging so what we tend to do is try and have more than one lane for for the shots and so what we'll do is we'll pick sequences that um you know different companies have different strengths as well so you might have stereo d once do do one sequence or one part of a movie and and legend do another part and you know, double negative or d neg maybe do another part um you know it just depends on um you sort of casting the movie you're casting those those uh, stereo conversion companies have relationships with visual effects companies, and so you're casting based on all kinds of things like that to try and make it run as smoothly as you can, and also create um, more parallel paths for for the shot to get done, for the movie to get done. So how do you do like particle effects, like snow, and rain, and transparencies? You know, those things can look really great in 3D or not look great. <laughs> Well, like, you know, an in Infinity War, where there's a sequence with snow. Um, I don't know if you remember seeing it. Um, uh, and it's, um, and Digital Domain was the visual effects company on that sequence. And they were nice enough to, we approached them and said, like, listen, the snow is, is really prominent in the scene and we really see it well and we could convert it, but can you, would you be able to render it for us? And so they rendered all that snow as stereo native renders now everything else in the frame is converted but the, the snow is all rendered as two separate left and right eye renders and it it's just amazing i think it looks so cool and um much better than just straight converted snow would look um and it's really a, it's a fun sequence for me because it, it's a subtle thing but it's like it's it, it's really it's really there and that's all like that's the snow that in 3d space like that's so you know it, it varies a bit but whenever whenever we can we try and do stuff like that okay and the transparencies how does that work transparencies it can be trickier but once again it, you know we have a the luxury on these films of being visual effects movies where almost always very often those transparencies are 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 on layers inside a visual effect shot and so we're able to get those as separate elements and put them back in space um, instead of having to go in and recreate them, the recreating of the transparency is the trickiest thing. Okay. It's... So, oh, are you finished? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, what Marvel movie was the most difficult and what was the easiest to convert? Uh, I don't know about an easy one, <laughs> but I think the most challenging for me personally was Dr. Strange. I, just because it was, um, I think the bar was really high, and 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 the imagery itself um, conf confounded a lot of our tools. It was very a very tricky movie to get right, um, and it paid off. I mean, it, you know, the work was there and it worked out, but it was it, it was a very that was a challenging movie. Um, every movie has its own kind of ups and downs for sure. I, I can't think of an easy one off the top of my head because we push it really hard. Every movie we try and do better, but, um, but yeah, that one was, that one was particularly, you know, everyone kind of felt that one. Well, you guys did great. So, uh, you know, I applaud you for that. And Dr. <laughs> Strange looked amazing in 3D. So. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, is Marvel going to continue reducing 3D movies over uh, 3D versions of the films for the entire future? Uh, well, you know, it, it's sort of a never say never thing, I suppose. But I mean, nobody's um, and people here seem to like the format, and and it's you know our movies are a big player on the international market as well. We're just on the cusp of releasing in China for Infinity War, and uh, those markets drive a lot of the demand as well. So I don't see why we wouldn't 
keep going. I mean, Disney in general seems to really like the format. So we, yeah. we you know, we were encouraged to do it. Um, if the Marvel one shots return, any chance you'll do 3d for those two or those be 2d only? I, you know, I, we've talked occasionally about those and uh, th they tend to be driven. I, I think the one shots generally were released in the home market and home 3d is becoming harder and harder. You've really got to be motivated to see 3d in the home at these days. Um, it, 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 you know, as the TVs, they sort of stopped selling most of the TVs, right? Mm -hmm. So the market is diminishing rapidly in the home. I mean, you've got to buy essentially now you got to have a projector or something like that. So I doubt we would do it, but, um, it would be, you know, you never know. <laughs> never know. The VR goggles are still happening. So, you know, you could do it that way too. So, you know, some 3D conversions do suffer from like a cardboard cutout look. How does, how do you guys make it not look that way? Well, I, I, you know, it's a, that's an aesthetic thing more than anything. So we, we, we put a lot of time into making sure we have our characters have a lot of internal volume and also the environments around them do, because I think it, it I, I kind of want you to, it's, it's funny how it goes, but it's like you want the viewer to experience the shot the way they imagine it should be, not the way that it actually would be if you, you know what I mean? But the way they imagine it would be, <laughs> if you know what I mean, it's, those are not always the same thing. And so, cause we'll, we'll do that. We'll say like, Oh, well this is rendered in 3d. I'm like, Oh, it looks wrong. You know, his nose looks too long or whatever. And so you, you, you kind of want, but you want the character's faces to not be distorted. You want, and my feeling is generally more internal volume is better for that purpose. So, um, that's the way we do it. Some people actually kind of creatively prefer that Cardi look. And so they, they don't even, it's not that they couldn't do it in another way. They just don't. You know, it definitely takes longer to do it the way we do it. So cost could be a factor too, but, um, cause there's more, you know, you spend more time regioning out the person's face and stuff like that. And there's more paint, things like that. But, um, so there's probably a, other considerations there, but for us, that's, we do it, you know, because we like it that way. Now I have noticed since Dr. Strange, I feel like the 3d Marvel movies has really stepped up the quality. Is there a specific reason for this or it just me noticing it more? I just feel like the, it's like before Dr. Strange, I liked the 3d. It was nice. Yeah. But after it's like so much better, especially last three or four movies. I think that, I think that as time's gone on, we've, we've had more and more confidence from the filmmakers here to kind of let us um, go a little crazier. We've definitely been creeping deeper in terms of our overall presentation and sort of the, the philosophy that, that I've had is really like if people are buying the ticket, let's give them, give them their money's worth, you know? And so that's what we've been trying to do. Um, and yeah, and yeah, Dr. Strange was a turning point in that respect because we, we kind of were, we were given, you know, kind of carte blanche to say, let's go is, you know, let's make an experience out of this. And then when it, when it was well received, I think we were really put in a, in the driver's seat to say like, well, we can even do more with this. And so it's funny because now the movies we're putting out are even deeper than strange was, but, um, but you know, that was a turning point for sure. Creatively. No. Let's get to Infinity War. Obviously, we do not want to spoil this for anyone that has not seen it. Now, um, I do want to talk about the segment of the movie toward the end. Not, it's going to be really hard to not spoil, but <laughs> there is definitely a decision that was made regarding the 3D usage for this movie. And as a moviegoer, I think everyone in the theater was shocked by how the 3D was done, and by the story. So this decision was obviously deliberate. How did you get to, how did this decision get made? Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, well, I mean, are you, you're, you're talking about the, the, the sort of the very end of the film? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we what we wanted to do, I mean, we really focused on that part of the movie because because the film at that stage was kind of getting into some really deep territory emotionally. And we said, like, this is where we really want to go. Um, we want to focus on this spot. We really want to make people uh, we wanted to make the most of that moment, if you will. And and so 
um, when we were sort of designing the film in terms of the depth budget, of course, throughout the film, that was a bit, that was a beat where we said, no, we need to really deliver the goods at this, at this stage to, um, kind of make people aware of it. Yeah. At first I was confused. And then when my wife whispered to me, Hey, this is actually done a choice. And I was like, Oh, you're right. Oh my God. And other people that saw it in 3d had a, had a similar experience. We're like, Oh my God, that's a brilliant choice. And I, I never forget this. This is one of the top moments. I was like, Oh wow. I will not forget how, how watching infinity war in 3d, the choice that you guys did. And I really applaud you for that. And I, I said that in my review and I was like, damn, this is just a smart decision. And, you know, really makes you think and, you know, you guys, bravo, bravo. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. So tell the team, you know, I definitely, we definitely noticed it in the theater. We definitely were like, whoa, that's amazing. So it's kind of hard to talk about without spoiling it, but <laughs> You know what I'm saying. If you've seen it in 3D, you know what I'm saying. And hopefully people don't. Get, hopefully most people get it like I got it and my wife got it, and now people yeah. get confused. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you guys done with the uh, 3D aspect of Ant Man and the Wasp? Or? No, no, no. We've got we're we're still uh, right in the middle of it. So there's lots of uh, we've got lots to do on that film still. It's gonna, that one's going to be a fun one. There's the Ant-Man movies, the f first Ant-Man movie, we, we spent a lot of time playing with scale. Every time we'd go into the small environment, trying to figure out how we were going to kind of really, really reinforce the fact that he was small and, you know, uh, the, we're doing, and we're doing a lot more of that in this one. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's going to be a fun one for 3D. Yeah. I remember that a lot. The 3D depth was really great in that man. And it really got me into it. And, um, you know, I look forward to watching them in the Wasp in July. And uh, what advice would you give for anyone that wants to get into the professional 3D industry? I think it's, um, I think there's a, you know, there's certainly opportunities there um, for people that are, that are interested in that line of work. It's it, to me, um, like I said, it's, it's kind of the, the foundational skill set is, is really visual effects. So, and, and to some extent photography and th sort of understanding, um, understanding how how photographing things changes the way that they look and stuff like that is is really helpful sort of understanding how lenses work and all that so so i think you know having a foundation in that is would be incredibly helpful um and then you know by all you know absolutely just like you know there's not as much happening uh in the united states unfortunately there's a lot of stuff happening overseas in terms of a lot of our work is done in those environments but um but it's, you know, there's a, certainly, a, I mean, if you look at the number of movies that are being released in 3D, there's still quite a bit of work out there to be done and the chance to work on some big stuff. So I, I encourage people to get into it. Do you have any final statements regarding 3D and Marvel Studios and what fans can expect for the future and the role of 3D in the future films? Um, I feel like we've kind of covered it. But I, I, you know, for me, I, I, I hope people, I think part of the reason I've, was happy to talk to you was just sort of hopefully demystifying some of it because it is such a strange, um, there's a strange thing to 3d. It's a, it's a, it's a very, um, personal experience and people, um, people experience our movies completely different. You know, you'll, you'll see people love it and other people hate it in the same movie. It, it, it's fascinating to watch. And, and I've seen that over the years is that people would come to 3d with, um, you know different expectations and 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 they experience the movie differently but hopefully they sort of see that it's nothing else we're this is not something that we're doing um as some sort of shoddy experience we're, we're putting quite a bit of time and energy and effort into trying to give people um the best experience we can so um hopefully that's the way they see it okay well thanks for this great interview and um thanks again yeah yeah, that was super fun. I'm, I hopefully, uh, hopefully we covered everything. It feels like it feels like we must have, right? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks bye. so much for having me. Bye. All right. Bye. After these messages, we'll be right back. This podcast is brought to you by 3D Wiggle. With 3D Wiggle software, you can impress your family and friends with 3D gifts and videos. To find out more information. 
please click on the link in the description for 20% off coupon as well. This podcast is also brought to you by Patreon. With Patreon, you can become a patron and get this podcast commercial free and get many more benefits. Please click on the description again to get more information. Now, back to the show. All right, so that's going to be it for this podcast. We now have a Patreon, and the link is in the description. Uh, Thanks for watching. And we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. They don't put it everywhere. Just look for us, 3D or 2D. And, of course, review us on iTunes. And if you want to write us a letter, um, our email address is email 3 d or 2 d at gmail.com. So that's going to be it. Uh, Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Excelsior! Um, One final quick question. So what's your favorite DC Comics movie? (laughs) You know what? I thought Wonder Woman was great. I I think we all, I mean, you know, I I wouldn't say, you know, maybe the movie's not perfect or whatever, but I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. We're all fans, you know what I mean? So it's like we all just want, you know, if you go back a bit, I mean, certainly the Batman movies were great, but I mean, they, Nolan doesn't like 3D so much, so. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I'm comic um, agnostic. I love them all. If they have a good story, I will watch it and I will love it, and, you know. For me, you know, I grew up watching X Men in the nineties cartoon. Oh yeah, Spider Man and Batman and Justice League, and I watched it all because I love the stories, I love the characters, you know. So, you know, there's for me the the rivalry is overblown. It should. Oh, be that God. Big. it's not something we, you know, everybody in the halls here at Marvel. That's all. We we're all fans. We just want everybody to. We all want to see those movies too. So, it's it's you know, they'll. Uh, you know, it will be interesting to see what what James uh, Wan does with with Aquaman. I think it's going to be that's going to be an interesting one because he's a he's a great filmmaker and you know, I love Jason. Uh, Jason Momoa was in Conan, of course, and so I'm a big fan of his. So I'm interested to see how they go. All right, thank you for listening so far. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, I, I really need your reviews on iTunes and any other podcast source um, you may be listening to this or if it's on YouTube, remember to like it or what, whatever. Um, you know, we need those reviews. Uh, and I know it sounds just like an ego trip, but the thing is, it really does matter. Those reviews help people find this podcast and help me generate more content like this because no one wants to be on a podcast that no one listens to. And no one's going to see a podcast if no one gets it gives it ratings i might be the 150th 3d podcast but if i have good ratings i may jump up to 100 and as i jump up more reviews more people would be interested in doing content so it's a feedback loop and i need you to start it so please give me ratings on itunes on Stitch Radio, on, you know, share this with your friends and family on Facebook and Twitter. You know, I need that to help to generate more people with interest, you know, comment. You know, those things actually do matter. They do really help podcasters like myself. And if you really enjoyed this content, you know, please give me a star rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to it. You know, there's different ways to review things. So just look into it, please. And it really helps support the show by just simply liking us and giving us a rating and sharing this with your friends and family. So that's it for this podcast. Before this podcast ends, I want to give a thank you to my patrons. Right now, we have a one patron, which is David from Spain, and I want to thank you for your financial support to help making this possible. If you want your name to be called out and your location, uh, please uh, become a patron on Patreon. Um, our link should be in the description, and or just look for us, 3D or 2D, on Patreon, and you get plenty of benefits. 
So again, thank you, David, from Spain, and I hope to have many more Patreon patrons um, with us soon. Thanks again, David. Bye.